Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Really excited to be talking about biology, talking about arachnology. We have Dr. Lauren Esposito joining us. Hi. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Really appreciate it. It was so fun when we met as TEDx speakers yeah. in San Francisco. And I was like, okay, yeah, she's really cool. We definitely got to get her on the show. <laughs> and I was like, yes, yes, yes. Because you had an actual like scorpion during your talk. I did. And, and you were like, you were holding it, teaching about it. And it was, it was a baby. It was like a baby. It was, it was so like small. a grown adult, but it was just really <laughs> tiny. <laughs> yeah, it was a grown adult, but it was really tiny. And so there's all these different insects that exist that are need to be classified, especially spiders, arachnids, spiders, uh, scorpions, and their kin. And how do we hunt down the unclassified ones and yeah. classify them? Yeah. It's a good question. Like, how do you know what you don't know? Yeah. And that's what you get to study. That, that's <laughs> that. Well, I get to I study all like various aspects of arachnid biology, but I would say really that's my that's like my baby. That's the thing that I love doing more than anything is, is figuring out what's out there that we haven't figured out was out there yet. Yes. Yeah. The unknown unknowns. Now, all right, before we get into all the nuance and there's, I'm super excited to unpack it. Tell us about you. How did you end up figuring out that this was what you cared about? I always think of it as kind of like a series of, of mistakes <laughs> that ended serendipitously. <laughs> Um, I, you know, actually, I, I was born into, into a biology family. My parents are both biologists. Um, so maybe it was kind of predestined that I'd become a biologist of some sort. But I hadn't really thought about what kind of biologist. I just knew what I didn't want to do, and I didn't want to be a veterinarian, which is what my father was. Because I couldn't, like, stand the idea of having to, like, put animals to sleep. It was mm -hmm. too intense for me. And... And, but I loved nature, and one of my favorite things to do as like a pretty young child was to go out into my parents' garden and like flip over all the pavers. Yeah. <laughs> because underneath all the pavers was like earwigs and roly polies and cockroaches, and mm -hmm. so I'd like flip over all the pavers and move all the bricks and like you know totally disrupt their garden. But <laughs> I was looking for insects, and and in the early years I would bring them into my mom like alive in my hands probably mostly I grew up in an urban setting and like a lot of cockroaches and my mom she, I would say she wasn't like in like thrilled about bringing like her three-year-old daughter bringing live cockroaches inside so she taught me how to make a, what's called in entomology is called a killing jar hmm. and basically what that is is a jar like an empty peanut butter jar and in an like in an amateur kind of way, all you have to do is take a cotton ball and dip it in fingernail polish remover and throw it in the jar, and it creates like a like a euthanasia gas that humanely Whoa. euthanizes insects. And since my mom was a biologist, she knew this, so she taught me how to euthanize the insects so that I could bring them inside rather than bringing them inside alive. And that was kind of oh. like my earliest insect collection. Um, and I I would love to say that like from there I just like continued <laughs> with my dream of becoming an entomologist, but Really, actually, I forgot. Like, I grew up mm -hmm. and became a teenager and was, like, hated everything and forgot that I love insects and just, like, exploring the world around me. Was that when you were 10 when you were <coughs> for bringing them in? No, I was, like, three or four. You were four. three? But yeah, I was, I was, like, a tiny kid. Whoa. And I, I would keep them in, a, like, an egg carton that mm -hmm. was empty, and yep. I would put, like, an insect in, in each, each little egg, egg cup, cup and yeah. I had them in my bedroom, and, I like, you know, they got thrown away at some point, but... What an interesting thing, though, that you can euthanize them humanely yeah. by putting a nail yeah. polish cotton ball inside. That's a good thing for kids to know it when is. you want to go and. It's a lot better study. than keep like torturing them to a slow death in a jar. Like just humanely euthanize them. You can also euthanize them by putting them in a freezer. Oh yeah, that's right. You can freeze them, and then you can now get like fifty dollar, one thousand time microscopes that are digital, and you can yeah. then go and start looking at them. Yeah, things don't yeah. like to cooperate when they're alive. Um, yeah, which is yeah. unfortunate for my job, but <laughs> but uh, you know, it was so it was really helpful that I learned how to do that at a young age, and like I had a little microscope that I would look at things under, and yeah. I was really into tide pooling and stuff, and it was so then it wasn't until like college mm -hmm. when I when I started to rediscover my love for, for things tiny. Because you went for biology at I El did. Paso. Yeah. yeah, I went to the University of Texas El Paso, the university in my hometown. Mm -hmm. And I, 
I was originally pre-med as a major mm. because I thought like, oh, I like biology and I want to like have a job so I should go to medical yeah. school because <laughs> that was like the only things I knew of that you could do as a biologist was become a doctor, become a dentist or become a veterinarian. And I was pretty and sure so I didn't want to do more. any of those. <laughs> yes. And look at how much more we were just talking about this on the way in. There's so much opportunity that kids, children may not be aware of that exists in the field of biology. Well, and how ironic, like my, both my parents were biologists. My mom was not, was, my mom was a wildlife biologist. Wildlife, so I knew yeah. there were other career options, but yeah. like still even didn't consider that I could do those careers. Yeah. We need more, and this is part of the science communication thing that we'll yeah. talk about. It's just that we need more role models um, communicating to children saying that, hey, you can be a wildlife biologist. You can be an entomologist. Yeah. Like there's all these things that, w that we may not have had the right role models introducing to young people. So, so then, okay, so biology at El Paso and yeah. then. And then, um, you know, so then about like my junior year of college, so I started college, I was a pre-med major and I was minoring in business. I was like, I'm gonna do this all the way. Like I'm gonna go to medical school with a business like minor and know how to run a business when I get out. And I was like, man, what am I doing? This is, <laughs> this is not where I'm supposed to be. I was like sitting in accounting class and being like, yeah. oh, I know oh. that this is what I'm interested in. Um, and then I took this class called field biology. Nice. And basically what it was, it was like a one credit class. So like, kind of like an elective. Mm -hmm. And basically what it was is you came up with a research project and then you went to the field as a class for one week and you did the project that you came up with and then you came back and wrote up the results. Mm -hmm. And the project I came up with, we, we went, the place we were going was this um, beach area in northern Baja, California on the Sonoran Desert side. So like mainland Mexico, mm -hmm. but in the north of the Sea of Cortez. Mm -hmm. and uh, we were in this intertidal zone that's the largest, one of the largest intertidal zones in the world. So like the difference between where high tide is and low tide is, is like, like hundreds of yards. And so there's lots of things that you can look at because oh. there's things that like to live in that intertidal zone. Oh, a couple hundred yard yeah. high tide, low tide, whoa. Yeah, so like at low tide, there's like hundreds of, of yards of beach <laughs> yeah. exposed. Oh, that might be our UPS uh, package. UPS. Has I love UPS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or USPS, yeah. <laughs> we have a package. So they just leave mine in the front of the house and don't tell me. <laughs> yeah. It's like always a mystery if I really got something or if it like disappeared because somebody stole it. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is how this why door uh, men or women have become so popular nowadays because yeah, they door people are great, right? Packages and that's but also like, like what's up thing. with the doorbell? Like I have one. How come you don't ring it? Ring it, it doesn't yeah. make any sense to me. Yeah, we have a call box. How come you don't ring it? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like, boom, we got the package. All right, we are back at it. So. Right. So the high tide, low tide differences, yeah. that's crazy. So with a couple hundred yards, what are tip, what are you typically finding? There's all kinds of really cool stuff that live in that zone. And like some of the things that you see are, are things that you might see in a tide pool. So like brittle stars, um, sea stars, sand dollars. But the thing that I, the project that I came up with that I wanted to go and do was to study fiddler crabs. You know, the little ones with a really big hand. <laughs> and they're one of the things that lives at that intertidal zone, right? And my, I came up with this brilliant project. I, I had to do the literature review, so I had to like go into the library and look up like all the studies that have been done on cr fiddler crabs. And the project I came up with was to c dig up fiddler crabs, actually just dig up beach, like sand, these, right? These, these, yeah, they guys, live in yeah. these like holes down in the sand. And what I was doing was going out onto the beach, digging up a meter square, a meter cube, so like one meter by one meter by one meter of sand onto mm -hmm. a tarp, mm -hmm. and then like picking out all the fiddler crabs and counting how many of them had a big right hand and how many of them had a big left hand. Interesting. Because it turned out nobody had ever studied that. Nobody had ever done any kind of scientific study to see whether there's like a predominant handedness in fiddler crabs. Predominant handedness in fiddler crabs. <laughs> yeah. What a dissertation. <laughs> So that was like my first undergraduate so project yeah. that I ever did. That was like That's a real cool. scientific so cool. design. How does one even know, uh, like where do you go and research? Like how, how would I know where to look to figure out if that study's been done yet or not? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, now it's like so much easier than it was back then. Like then I went to the library and like looked up in like the Dewey Decimal catalog, <laughs> like what? Yeah. If there was any journal articles. <laughs> um, but now it's to access scientific journals, most people can do it just by going to Google Scholar search. So yeah, and just then like, you'd look up fiddler crap. Yeah, and Google Scholar is like just like it looks like normal Google, but it just searches within scientific literature. And yeah. you could look up like fiddler crab. You could first figure out like the scientific name of fiddler crabs. Which is what? Oh, I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, that yeah. was like decades yeah, was ago. So now, was there a dominant hand in this, and why do you? Well, do you it know? turned out that it was pretty patchy. So, like some patches of the beach, like so, certain stretches of the beach had predominantly right hands, and other patches of the beach had predominantly left hands. And I don't know why. I've never done a follow-up study. I probably should. And it's a one predominant hand. The other one's not. Yeah, as so large. Only basically, one large. like one of them gets knocked off. In, in, like, as the crab is developing. So like oh. when it's a little crab, one of them gets knocked off and whichever one gets knocked off regrows as a large hand. Whoa. Yeah. I wonder if this image, sometimes it's weird because <coughs> when you look at these, you wonder if it's actually, if it's actually. It know. is that big, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. huge. Like they look like they have this weird gimpy baby hand and then like a giant. That's And they're using those hands to like try to entice females. So the females have two more medium sized hands. Interesting. And then they also have like a tiny, like yeah. ridiculous hand, that's and so then other ridiculous. super yeah. big ridiculous hand. That, that is a that's a that's a lo that's a uh, signal for breeding for mating. Yeah, basically what it is is it's like allowing the females to evaluate the strength, strength, relative strength, because they yeah. have to carry this like massive thing around, so they must have a lot of like caloric uh, energy mm -hmm. available to them sure. in order to like maintain this massive thing that they're sure, carrying sure, around. Sure. Now, okay, now how did it go from that project to? Right, so I'll, I'll preface it by saying that that is not an arachnid, right? Yeah, So correct. there was like a few steps in between <laughs> my fiddler crabs and my arachnids. Yes. Um, and the next thing that, that I, the next class I took was entomology. So I was like kind of like tightening in on the things that I was interested in. And that class was great. I like made a bug collection, but this time for reals, not in little egg cups mm -hmm. in my parents' backyard. Mm -hmm. um, and. So that entomology class made me start looking at summer internship opportunities. And I found one that the advertisement was arthropod evolution. And I was like, oh, I like arthropods, like crabs and insects. Yeah. So uh, arthropod evolution sounds like really interesting. And it was at the American Museum of Natural History. It was a paid internship. Nice. And you I were applied. there for like seven years weren't I was you? there for quite a while yeah. but this was back when I was an undergrad and I applied and I got it and I went and, and that's I, in New York it's by in Central New York Park. City yeah I was like New York City New York City the yeah. flashing lights the All big right. apple yeah I was coming from Texas Texas El Paso it was a quite it was like you know I was like a, in the big city but this did you ever do snow before that yeah it snows sometimes in Texas in spite of popular perception okay okay um but it was also the summer, so I didn't see snow. Not, not six either. months of freezing cold temperatures, though. No. Yeah. And I got to New York, and I um, didn't know who I would, was going to be interning with, but ended up interning with their curator of arachnology, this guy That's named really Lorenzo right. Prendini. Lauren? Lorenzo. Oh, Lorenzo Ziprendini. Lorenzo Prendini. And Lorenzo he's, Prendini. he's a South African scorpion biologist who had just been Sweet. hired as a curator of arachnology at the American Museum of Natural History. And I worked with him all summer. Actually, he left for most of the summer. So I worked with him at the beginning and the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. And discovered that I liked scorpions. Like, they were pretty all right. I wasn't, like, committed. But I was yeah. like, oh, they're pretty all right. Yeah, yeah. And You were keeping your options open. Yeah, I was <laughs> keeping my options open. And, and I spent the summer, like, extracting DNA from scorpions in a molecular lab, in a genetics lab, and looking at the collection of scorpions that the American Museum had had. Nice, so um, you were learning about how to classify them based on their DNA. Both based on their DNA and I was working in the collection with actual specimens, learning how to classify them and, and curate them, like what being a curator means, yeah. what that process consists of, like ensuring, and you know, what being a curator is, we can talk about a little bit more later, but, but at the time what I was doing is I was pulling scorpions out of like actually five gallon buckets that had just arrived to the museum. Whoa. They were huge, like huge amounts of scorpions, dead scorpions. Yeah. Out of five gallon buckets. Yeah. Um, they'd been dead a long time by the time I ever saw yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And I was looking at the labels that were attached to each scorpion and recording that information in a database. Mm -hmm. 
that we could use to make maps of where they were distributed because mm. for most scorpions we don't have things like distribution maps yeah you know like have you ever opened a book like a birding book and there's like a map of where you can see this bird yeah we don't have that for scorpions because yeah, yeah. a lot of scorpions we only know from a couple of individuals we don't really know where the species occurs so they're sending you a five gallon bucket from a specific geographical area yeah so in this case what had happened is they had a, uh, received a donation of a of another collection that somebody had, this guy, he had spent his whole life collecting scorpions and he donated his whole collection to the American Museum and it showed up in five gallon buckets. Whoa. And it was my job over the summer to, to curate those specimens and, yeah. and, and put them into the proper jars and make sure their information was recorded and all that kind of stuff. And so then did you, how did you figure out that, okay, fine, I'll, I'll do. Well, I still, you know, still I was like, oh, I don't know, like if I'm that committed to this, but I, I started thinking about what I was going to do for my PhD, well, not even there yet. I started thinking about what to do next, and I was like, okay, I've decided I don't want to go to medical school, what do I want to do? And I was like, ah, PhD, like, then I, I don't have to get a job, I can just, go, like, continue <laughs> studying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is like a job, it's, it's it worse is. than a job, it's like <laughs> an 80 hour a week job, but I could continue studying and learning, and that's what I really wanted to do. So, I applied to PhD programs, and City of Un City University of New York. Yeah, that was one of the ones I applied to, and because Lorenzo said to me, "Hey, um, as part of my position here at the American Museum, I'm also faculty at the City University of New York, so you could come and do a PhD with me if you wanted." And I said, "You know, that's not the worst idea." <laughs> <laughs> and well, now like 16 years later, here I am. Here you are. What yeah. What did I say? So now, as you go and start doing the PhD at City uh, University of New York. Now you start slowly falling in love more and more. And what was your dissertation on? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, so I just like started learning all this information about scorpions that made me realize that, that they're a, a great model system to understand many of the basic tenets of biology, things like evolution. They're, they're one of the oldest predators that's, that ever came onto land from the sea. This is like 300 million? No more. 500 million. Like 450 yeah. million years ago. Yeah. They came out onto land from the ocean. Most things at that time lived in the ocean. Yes. Definitely most things with an exoskeleton. Like so there were a few worms and some fungi and some kind of like proto plants, not real yeah. plants. Yeah. That were, that were on land, but in terms of all the things with an exoskeleton, it was all in the ocean. Yep. And scorpions were coming up onto land, and, and it's been hypothesized that one of the things that they were doing in those early days was they were actually amphibious, so they were mostly living mm -hmm. in the ocean, yep. but they were coming out onto land to get to like snatch salmon or the ancestors of salmon that were spawning upriver out of the river. So like mm -hmm. basically what grizzly bears do, because the, the salmon mm -hmm. get up into this shallow water where they're really easy picking. picking they're yeah. like congregating in mass numbers, and so for a predator it's like a buffet, buffet like all yeah. you can eat buffet, yeah, you know? Yeah. And those scorpions were probably taking advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, and now they're fully terrestrialized along with most other things. And uh, there that's are no, there's no aquatica scorpions anymore. So that's also very interesting about evolutionary biology is that you study from 450 million years ago the process of the terrestrialization yeah. of, an, of a creature yeah. to the point where there's no more of them that live in water. Right. And there's hum well, yeah. some, in some cases, they've like actually secondarily colonized water again. Like spiders, for example, there's a, a group of spiders that mm. lives in water, the diving bell spider. Um, but basically, you can see all these like hints of ancestry from from like their anatomy of what their ancestors used to be like. Like this is a tarantula, right? This weird little model mm -hmm. I have here, and in the tarantula, there's this is like a anatomical model, which is maybe like mostly accurate. But the thing I like about it is this part right here. This is the respiratory system, this green bit. And as part of the respiratory system, it has these little things that look like, I don't know, like a golf club. It's with a yellow end right here. And it would normally sit inside the body and this part would be sitting up like in a little pocket where it's exposed to air. So it's not outside of the body, but it's not like encapsulated in the body either. And what these are, they're called book gills. 
or book lungs, and it, it's basically like a gill, like you know a fish gill? Have you ever yeah. seen a fish yeah. when they're opening their gills yes, up? Yes. And you can see there's like lots of little white lines that are the gills. And that's what helps them get the oxygen. Yeah, because it provides more surface area. Uh -huh. And these, these book uh -huh. lungs are basically internalized gills, so they took all those little flaps that increase surface area and pulled them into their body. And oh. now, it's, now oh, they actually have pages, which is why it's called a book lung because there's individual oh, pages oh, yeah, yeah. and those pages help increase the surface area so that they can breathe. So they actually just passively absorb air from outside. They absorb oxygen Interesting. from air that's passing over those book lungs passively. So they're not like breathing in and out. They're just passively respiring. Okay. So there's no, that's so interesting. So there's not really a, the respiratory system is not really a, uh, Inhalation, exhalation. No, it's passive. It's a, it's just a, there's no, there's no inhalation, exhalation. It's just a constant flow of oxygen coming in slowly bit by bit at yeah, a time. Yeah, they just have this book lung in this pocket that's exposed to the outside of their body. And that air comes in and it flows over the pages of the book lung. That's basically an internalized gill. And then oxygen diffuses into their body, which is actually one of the things that limits their body size. So like people are always like, how big can, a, can an arachnid get? Mm -hmm. Well, they can only get it as big as the oxygen can reach their tissues because they have no active respiration. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So then they're limited to the, the, bi the biological mechanisms in size. So that the, they're actually limited to the chemical mechanisms of how quickly oxygen can diffuse into tissues, into cells. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Interesting, but this is about the largest <coughs> tarantulas that you'll get, right? I mean, that one's bigger than you would ever see a tarantula in real life. Like the largest tarantula in real life, uh, like two thirds of that size. Okay, yeah, yeah, which is still like pretty interestingly pretty hefty. big, yeah. yeah. And that one's like, it's called a Goliath bird eater, and it, Goliath it, bird it's eater. unclear whether it actually eats any birds, but they live in South America. Interesting. So this respiratory system is really interesting. Now, um, now was this part of the thesis, the, the dissertation? It was, had, had nothing to do with no, it. It had nothing to like, do with it. Just like this conversation, just had, a, okay, a tangent. Cool. Now, but no, it was one of the things that made me like really intrigued with, with scorpions as a model system because yes. there's all these telltale signs of their ancestors. But my dissertation was really focused on understanding the evolution and classification system of one group of scorpions. Okay. And the, they're called the bark scorpions. The bark scorpion? Yeah. And that bark scorpion, like, tell us a bit about what you learned about it. Well, it's not like, it's not bark like a dog. It's bark like a tree. Yep. Um, because they live, typically they, they live um, in crevices, and often those crevices are, like, in under Sonoran the tree. Sonoran Desert. Of, Sonoran Desert, yeah. Well, the Arizona bark scorpion lives in the Sonoran Desert, but they're actually distributed from... Like they get all the way up into like sort of middle America, middle United States. And you can find them all the way down into Northern South America. They're found in the Galapagos, they're found in all the Caribbean islands, Central America, this Mexico. This is like a pretty fairly common uh, scorpion like appearance. Yeah. Yeah. It's like standard looking scorpion. Standard looking scorpion. They're called the bark scorpion. Yeah, the bark scorpion. And, and I was interested in this group because they're one of the only groups of scorpions that we have here in sort of northern America, so like Mexico and the U.S., that poses any danger to humans. Why? Because they have venom that's toxic to us. So w now, I think I asked you this before, but what percentage of scorpions have venom that's toxic? It's really low. So there, right now there's about 20 to 2,400 species of scorpions that have been discovered by scientists. Mm -hmm. and documented formally. Mm -hmm. And of those, about 2% are dangerous to or humans. toxic to humans. So... Well, there's a higher percentage that are toxic to humans, but there's 1 or 2% that are dangerous to humans. That are dangerous, got it. So it's like 50 scorpion species. Yeah, max. 50 max. max. So only 2,400-ish have been classified scorpion yeah. species. Interesting. And so then you went really hard into one species yeah. for your... yeah. And part of the reason that it, it's inter it was interesting and, and also kind of a timely project is 
that um, there's there's a lot of pharmaceutical money that's invested into developing anti-venom f to combat stings from these scorpions. That's right, yeah. We had a company, um, Venomics, on, uh, who's an indie bio company that does a, a therapeutic for um, scorpion yeah, venom. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's problematic when you're a pharmaceutical company or a biotechnology company that's trying to develop something to combat a sting but the thing that is stinging in the first place isn't properly described, right? Like we don't actually, we weren't actually really sure how many species were posing a health problem. It could have been 10, it could have been five, it could have been three, it could have been 20, but nobody had taken the time to really redo the classification and tell the rest of the world how you tell these species apart. Yeah. And so I thought that it, that was, seemed like a good project. It had it had some impetus aside from just classifying for classification's sake, which yeah. I think is also really important. But it's a very rare scorpion stings are twenty thousand U.S. cases a year. Yeah. So th the one that we have um, that's potentially dangerous in the United States is a single species. It's the Arizona bark scorpion. It lives in Arizona and Lower Nevada yep. and and uh, Western New Mexico. The Arizona bark scorpion. Yeah, and it's um, it's not really da very dangerous to adults. Like, if you're a healthy adult, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> oh, whoa, the quarter there actually is really important. It helps with scale a lot. Yeah, they're not very big. They're a couple inches at most. Now, you brought one of your adults. Like, these ones are little babies. Those are so babies. Yeah. They're so small. No, you brought one of your adults with you. Yeah, I brought it, I brought the same scorpion that, that I had when we met. Awesome. Uh, it's from Malaysia. So let's show let's show this let's show this video quick. This is where this is oh, you. Yeah, so you can just, like, put your this is you going into the field in Malaysia. Yeah. And so this is kind it's of also what, a lot of me talking though. I'm talking a lot and And so but th my this office. is th yeah. <laughs> so, but this is really, this is, you know, this is what it looks like when you go and do literal field work. Like Just this like is, Indiana Jones. Like this is you right here in the field, like this image, yeah. you know, like That's in, me. like this is really interesting because, you know, here's you with a headlamp with a, uh, with a, what is that tool called that? That one that's right there, that, that's called a, a leaf litter sifter, um, leaf and litter it's sifter. just one of the w one of the tools that we employ to look for arachnids. Arachnids, it turns out, don't really like being found. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons we don't we haven't discovered a lot of them yeah. yet. Um, and that thing is is you take leaves and in the middle of it there's like a screen like a with a yeah like maybe quarter inch grid screen, and you take leaves in there and you you shake it up so that anything yep. that's smaller than a leaf will fall through the screen down into the bottom sleeve. Yep. Um, and then we collect the, all the stuff that's fallen through the bottom sleeve and like carefully look through it to see what's in there, looking mm -hmm. for spiders and mites, which are arachnids mm -hmm. and scorpions and anything that may have been hiding in the leaves. And, and so that's the process of going out into the field and sifting through the, again, they don't want to be found. So you yeah. have to sift through it and then you, and then you try and catch them and then you have to see if you've classified them before. So you have to then like compare it to the other 2,400 scorpion species right. to see if they've been classified before or not. Yeah, I mean, you can take some shortcuts. Like you can just look at the ones that, that are like live in Asia, let's say. Okay. Right, so you don't have to look at the ones that live in oh. the Americas because oh, it's sure. pretty unlikely to be those. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, you have to go through and like compare them with what we know and try to figure out if it's something we don't know yet. Yeah. It's yeah. like relatively straightforward, but also kind of sometimes a kind of a pain in the butt because it's not always obvious. Like in the real olden days, right? Like in the earliest days of people classifying animals, classifying life, there wasn't like picture, there were no high resolution photos. There was, there was oftentimes not even illustrations in, in scientific publications because like that was too costly to produce illustrations people could just produce type and so the a lot of the early descriptions were just like a description
sometimes in German, sometimes in Russian, sometimes in French. Yeah, just a description instead of a picture. But yeah. Now, now you can pull it up on your phone and, yeah. ma and make sure that it's the right one. Yeah, That's now so we cool. can like, you know, now we have like microscope imaging, so we can actually take images through a microscope of important characteristics that help with identification. That's and right. that's like that's like normal, that's standard that you would include in this a kind microscope of microscope photo. Yeah. This kind of description of a new species when you discover a new species you'd include lots of pictures. Exactly. Um, oh, but, that's so yeah. But back then you couldn't. So that was like that's just a hundred years ago, even yeah. Yeah. A hundred years, years ago we weren't yeah, fifty we weren't taking thousands of pictures, especially microscope pictures yeah. of these and we weren't, you know, able to to diagnose the inside of the biology of the of the creatures. I mean, we could. People were doing dissections and like very manually doing it all. Um, but one of the amazing things that has been in place since the earliest days of people classifying is museums. Yeah. And and what that means is that people were collecting s stuff from nature and bringing it back and putting it in a museum. Yep. And then when they discovered this, wrote about the, this description of a new species, they would also identify where it was, like what museum it was sitting in. And that's extremely helpful because what that means for me is as much of a pain as it is to like have to go to London and look at the British Museum of Natural History, yeah, yeah. I can actually go yeah. and look at those same scorpions that those people wrote about in their little description that they wrote of. Yeah. Now, now what is... What is the scorpion that you have? What is it? Where where does it classify it as? And what is it living in right now to sur <laughs> you know to survive? It looks like dirty paper. It's living in dirty paper. <laughs> That's its preferred <laughs> habitat. <laughs> um, so this is this is a um, a little scorpion that lives in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's. Scientific name is Lyochiles australasiae. What's the, and what would be the name that I would look up to? Mm, I don't know, look up that one. I'll well, tell you how, how to spell it. Yeah, how do I spell it's it? It's L-I-O-C-H-E-L-E-S. And the other name, part of the name will probably come up with it. It did? Yep. Lyochiles australiae. What is, let's see, oh. The Wikipedia says it's the dwarf wood scorpion. The dwarf wood scorpion. Sounds good to me. Belonging to the family Hemiscorpidae. Yep, it belongs to one of the 13 families of scorpions. Oh, yeah, of, of oh, yeah. Of so this little guy? Yeah, I'll yeah. show him you in just a second. So, so what this little guy, okay. this is a, like, I'll show you closer in just a second, but this little guy is about adult size. There are these tiny little scorpions, and where they live in Southeast Asia is in tropical rainforests like really humid, like super humid mm -hmm. forests. And they like to live in rotting logs. So when you said that he was living in a dirty paper, like that's exactly right, he's that's living in exactly a dirty right, paper. Yeah. He's just living in this wadded up piece of paper inside of a yeah. like plastic jar. And it's like really wet and kind of like just gross smelling because that's what he likes yeah, to live yeah. in. And they basically like this is something you got to get used to when you do field work. Is yeah. you got to get used to the sweaty, smelly. Sweaty and smelly is like the name of my the game. The name of the game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that's part of being a child is being cool with I playing. I think that that's what I love about being a field biologist. Is like it's I get to just play outside. Play all the time. outside. Yeah, not be stuck in a cubicle behind a desk. Yeah. Yeah. So so this tiny guy and whoa, he's like about the size of my thumbnail, right? He's He's harmless to humans. He has no toxins that affect Whoa. our bodies. Ron, do you get a good shot on it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Whoa, the way it just like moved its. Yeah. So his really, cool. his only defense is like hiding out or maybe like pinching with his little tiny claws, but that's about his Aww, only source of defense. Oh, it feels so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. And this Aww. is a guy I collected him in nature in Malaysia, and we're holding on to him because he's actually not quite an adult, fully adult. So we've been kind of <laughs> rearing him up in our lab. Plus, he's kind of adorable. He's like a great scorpion ambassador. 
a great scorpion ambassador. Wow. He doesn't even look like he really has a head or she, you know? Yeah, so scorpions um, kind of, one of the things about arachnids that make them arachnids is they have two main body parts, a prosoma, which is a, like a head, and an episosoma, which is like a body. And this guy, and most scorpions, the prosoma and the episosoma are really kind of fused. Like they look almost just kind of like the head is a bigger plate than the rest of the body. Mm. And oh, that's all that it is. It's, it's like, like a like plate a, at the end. So it's not it's really like a jut. It doesn't really jut out. Yeah, right. it's just like this first part right here is what its head is. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it doesn't like. Yeah, it doesn't jut out like a human's. It's just more part of the body. Yeah, like the, if you think of like a spider. Torso. Like this part right here is, is the his spider head. head, and but they kind of have a waist in between their head and their body, and scorpions don't really have a waist. They just have like a head that's the same width as their body, and then their tail at the end. Yeah. And now, now this tiny guy. There's like these are like there's lots of I mean these are so small. There's got to be lots of them that live in these dirty um, log <laughs> yeah. environments. Well, when you find a log with them in it, like it, there's just hundreds of them. There's hundreds it. of them. They like to live like kind of, I don't know that it's necessarily colonially, like they're not socializing, but they like to live in these like clustered communities. And maybe that's just because the habitat's perfect. Like they're, it's the perfect log with the perfect wetness and mm -hmm. they all just kind of move in. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're, they're not rare when you see them. Now, why is this a good ambassador? Because it's kind of like, like just calm, like chill, chill and calm and calm. Like, he has no toxic venom, so you can handle him safely. Pass it to kids, have the kids play with it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that way, kids don't become scared of insects. Yeah. Which is so weird. What's the deal with arachnophobia? Arachnophobia. I don't well, get it. You know, I, I kind of wonder sometimes. I think, I think arachnids. Well, I'm gonna say I'm gonna have to separate this into two components. First, okay. spiders. So people are scared of spiders. It's like an innate human fear to be scared of spiders. And I've thought about it like so much because it's like inevitably a question everybody asks, or like wants to talk to me about their arachnophobia. You want me to scoop them in there? Let's scoop them back so that we can keep focusing on convo. What I think is that Aww. arachnids move so. Aww. So otherly so cool. than we do. I'm like trying to smell the. It just smells like dirty paper towel. Yeah. Um, like people eat those. Yeah, they do. <clears throat> people eat those around the world. Yeah, it's like a little chunk of protein. It's like a chunk of protein. It's like a shrimp. It's like a shrimp. Yeah, that's yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, people eat those around the world. And yeah. In the, in the U.S., we've gotten the West to eat them by turning them into like chips and yeah. granola bars yeah. and stuff. We have we've had chirps chips on the show, which yeah. literally does that. So yeah, they do that with with insects. Crickets, right? crickets. crickets, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but people do eat scorpions as well. Especially in Southeast Asia, it's like they have like those you know those big uh, marketplaces with like huge swaths of them that you can take. I mean, they'll eat all it, they'll like in Southeast Asia and and especially countries that are protein limited, they'll eat any protein that's they available. Find, yeah. So please, yes, arachnophobia. All right. Yes. So I just think that they walk really like otherly. Like they, the way that they move is in such a way that's so unfamiliar to us, it makes us like feel fear. The way they move, it's like yeah, the, like the way they walk, like the eight legs. And yeah, like their gait, their actual movement. Yeah, the gait. Yeah. Like, like, an, like take an ant, right? An ant is an insect that has six legs. Ants don't move that weird. Like they move in this very predictable way. Like uh -huh. I don't think people look at ants and they're like, oh, that thing's moving in such a creepy way. But when they look at spiders, they feel that way. Oh, you think it's about the movement? You, aren't they a little like omnidirectional? Like can't like they can just start going to the side and then going forward and then going to most, the side. Yeah, yeah, like like most I would say like most um, arachnids because of the the orientation of their legs, they can really move in lots of different directions. Yeah. And plus, like I don't know, it's just like the order in which their legs move is like weird. But, also, it's been all I, the media, sorry, it's been it is, the media is, as well, the, right. this Hollywood propagation. I don't think it's just about the Hollywood propagation because yeah. you go, also go to cultures where there's no Hollywood yeah. and people are scared of spiders. R but not in Southeast Asia, right? Yeah. Oh, they are? Yeah, so, they don't yeah. want to be around spiders. Okay, yeah, yeah. But I would say with scorpions, there's something different. And like, I think spiders, people are like, oh my God, it's a spider. Like, get it away, or smush it, like, kill it immediately. 
But when people see scorpions, I think they have this other reaction where they're like, oh, that's really terrifying because they, they've heard that, sp that scorpions are dangerous like because of Hollywood, because of the media. But they're also curious because it's so like foreign. They're like, oh, what? but let me see it, just not from close up. Yeah. <laughs> you know? They're like, I'm scared of that, but I want to get like a s little closer look. Yeah. yeah that's, it's true, right? That's like, the gateway. Yeah. That's the gateway it's, drug. It's, then, so then that's why this guy's a good scorpion ambassador. The next thing you know, they're holding the, the scorpion. And they're like, oh, I can, oh, it's not dangerous? It's not dangerous? Yeah. 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 Wow, it is so fun. What is, what's over there? What do you have in those two jars? Those are also scorpions. So these are some specimens from our collection at the Academy. Whoa, look at that. This is on the bigger side. Whoa. He's dead but, and would also make a good ambassador. But like, you know, even though this guy is harmless because the toxins that he produces in his, in his tail are not dangerous, he, he's, he's big and like if he did sting you it would still hurt but it would be like a thumbtack right it'd be like getting a thumbtack jabbed in your hand like that hurts it's just not dangerous a thumbtack jabbed in your hand yeah that'd be how much it would hurt look at the bottom of this you get a good you, let's see if i can get a good when you go it's okay better over there okay ron ron we're getting i thought you were on that that cam but yeah this is yeah look at the bottom of it this is, this is very, very, very beautiful. So that, that guy right there is an emperor scorpion. Emperor scorpion. Yeah, and they live in Africa. And um, this one is not the biggest specimen I've ever seen by any stretch, but they're the, in terms of weight, they're the largest scorpions. Okay, by weight, this is yeah. the largest. Yeah, because you see how huge their hands are? Like, those hands are heavy. And they have this kind of stout body that's also uh, pretty pretty weighty, um, and they're big overall. Like their overall size is quite large. King scorpions. The emperor. The emperor scorpion. Mm -hmm. Now, doesn't what does an emperor scorpion eat? They eat what all the <coughs> other scorpions eat, which is anything they can catch. Anything they can catch. Yeah, um, and mostly that consists of like insects, um, mostly n insects that are active at night. So like crickets, cockroaches, moths. Things that are nighttime moving. And when the the emperor or scorpions just try and sting it f first. No, they no. would they would actually just try to crush it with their claws. Okay, so they try and grab it and crush it with yeah. their claws. They're probably not this kind of scorpion. The, both the the one that we just held that was alive. Yeah. The dwarf forest scorpion and the emperor scorpion. Both of those would use their claws as the predominant way of capturing <laughs> and subduing Thank prey. You, Okay, so claws for capturing something. And then what's, uh, tell us about that one again. And this one here, it belongs to the other main cate major category of scorpions, which is scorpions that subdue most things with their tail. And this is, uh, belongs to a family called Boothidae. And Boothidae is a group of scorpions that contains all scorpions that are dangerous to humans. Oh, this is one of the dangerous. Yeah, so this one is actually called Androctonus, Androctonus australis, australis. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the fat, fat-tailed scorpion, and that guy can kill an adult human. This can kill an adult human. Yeah, yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. So the venom's toxic. Yeah, the venom's very toxic. And it'll kill me in how long? Like, do I have like a day, yeah, couple hours? Yeah, a few hours. P typically what happens is the scorpion w would sing you, the uh, venom that it injects is a, like a, a, a mixture of multiple things, but one of the things that it's injecting into you is a neurotoxin. And neurotoxin, yeah. yeah. And, and what the neurotoxin does is it targets your, your cells of your nerve cells in your body. And it either tells your nerve cells to stop communicating, so it inhibits communication, Whoa. or it activates communication, telling your nerve cells to communicate, like sending a signal that something's happening, but not really. It's just it can drive you like crazy. tricking your body. Into yeah. It. And what that thing that it wants to convince your body is happening is pain. Yeah. Because its goal is to escape. Because oh, you are right. not a prey item; you are a predator. Predator, yeah. So it's you're getting stung because you are a predator. Because yeah. you're perceived as a predator. Perceived as a predator. And it's trying to like escape. It, like it's thinking that it's in a life or death oh. situation, right? Like it's Oof. it's sting or get eaten, and it stings. And um, 
it causes your body to feel pain even though nothing painful is really happening. Like the stinger is small. It's not really large enough to induce a extreme pain in your body, but it's telling your nerves to send a message to your brain that you're experiencing pain. This is, this is very, very like, you know, when you, when you, when you speak of things like getting stung and <clears throat> a neurotoxin hits, it's scary. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is Giza. Giza, Egypt is what I read yeah, here. Yeah, so you're reading yeah. the label on there, yeah. right? So at, in every, along with every scientific specimen is a label that tells when, where, and who collected it. This is 1959? Mm -hmm. So this is actually a record, like, this is like a little time machine that we're looking at right now. We are looking at a little time machine. Yeah. Yeah. It tells us what was happening on Earth at that place in time. That's right. What, what is the liquid it? that it's suspended in? It's suspended in ethanol, which is like ethanol. alcohol, like yeah. vodka. Yeah. Um, and that's what we use as, as that's like the, the standard preservative for, for arachnids. And how do you use a, um, how do you get a, how do you get the sheet of paper and you print ink on it and then you put it in there, but it survives the alcohol? Yeah, we use ethanol insoluble ink. Ethanol so insoluble ink. So just ink that doesn't and, wash away in ethanol. And same thing, paper insoluble. Mm -hmm. Well, we just use archival paper. Archival paper. That's yeah. what enables you to read like that. Yeah, cool. but you know, archival paper is like what you use like to back a piece of fine art or it's very common. Wow, this is nuts that this is that this was found in Egypt and it can it's an, has the neurotoxin ability to Wow. Yeah, you even have a little like Looks like a little like skull and crossroads. Skull crossroads. and crossroads. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Okay. So that is nuts. Now I have more questions for you. My yeah. my questions range everything from like unpacking this in more nuance um, because you were talking about the way that they eat. They you know they use the claws first to to kill smash the prey and then eat that and then. Um, what else about the survival of arachnids is quirky that we should know that's like fun knowledge? Well, my f <clears throat> one of my favorite facts about scorpions is that they give birth to live young. So they don't lay eggs. They yeah. just like straight up give birth. Like we do. And like baby scorpions come out. Yeah. Yeah, like we do. Yeah. You and can look a video up of it on YouTube and it's cray cray. It is. It, yeah. But it's kind of like what we do. With yeah, birth. it's like comes out of a birth canal. Exactly. Like a little baby scorpion. And it's, and it's, it's like alive. an amniotic sac, and it breaks out of the sac, sac. and it's like a live little scorpion. Boom. And it's out in the world. Now, well, it's actually like not, I mean, it's out in the world, but it's not on its own because totally the mom takes not. care of it. Yes. So then that's strange because if this is like 450 million years ago evolution, that I wonder, did they ever lay eggs? Um, it's, we, we have no evidence of them laying eggs and there's even some evidence that the ancestor of scorpions, which is this thing called a Eurypterid, okay. a sea scorpion, um, there's some evidence that, that Eurypterids also internalized their young. Um, it, that's debatable whether they gave birth or not, but, but certainly like the ancestors of scorpions at some point in time were laying eggs. Yeah. But one, I mean, it's really beneficial to life on land and like to not lay eggs, like moving into new areas of the of the world to give birth to live young, because then all it takes is one female. Right. One female who's oh. pregnant to make it to a new island that has no scorpions on it. And then suddenly, like, start a new population of scorpions in that place. Oh, versus if if it needed to do eggs and it couldn't. Versus if it needed to do eggs. You would have and to stay near its offspring, like yeah, where the eggs are laid. Right, right, yeah. right. Oh, like interesting. The, like, or say the eggs would have to make it to a new place. Oh, or you can be movable with your offspring. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So the offspring, either you'd lay an egg and you'd have to stay around it, or you could bring it with you while it's developing inside you and then go in. That, that's kind of funny because that takes us to the whole idea of like whatever anchor babies and stuff like that yeah. in, the, in different countries. You can go to a country while you're pregnant and then have your child there and stuff. That's, that's very, true. That's very interesting. So, whoa, the live, the live birth. Now, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so curious because the, 
how what you know we had this video up we didn't we didn't end up getting a show up, but that the male was like wrapping the female or was it the other way around oh, that spider yeah in the spider bondage spider bondage well so the other amazing thing about arachnids all arachnids spiders scorpions is that they all have courtship rituals in how they mate so yeah. like they don't have this like they don't like randomly just deposit eggs and sperm and like mate they they actually like the males court the females in every single case that we've uh, that we know of Whoa. Um, and that happens in all kinds of different ways. And in this one example that we were talking about earlier, the males of wolves, of this one species of wolf spider, they like find the female and they're like half her size. So it's like dangerous territory when they approach her. Like she could eat them. Yeah, she, yeah. Could eat, she could eat them if she wants to. Yeah. So what, what they've done, what they've ev like evolved through time is that the males actually like wrap the female's legs with silk they call it spider bondage. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it probably doesn't prevent the female in any way from eating him, really. Um, but that silk is probably very laden in pheromones and chemical signals telling her that he's a courting male. Mm -hmm. So it's probably like mm -hmm. less about restricting her movement and more about like communicating to her as much as you possibly can that you're a courting male and she should not eat you. Like you are of the same species and you're here for a different kind of purpose. Yeah. Yeah, the, the courting rituals. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm always trying to like anthropomorphize things and be like, I wonder how humans relate to that. <laughs> yeah, because we have our own like quirky courtship rituals. We ourselves. have all kinds of weird courtship rituals. We but do. one of the other BDSM. things. BDSM. That, that, yeah, I mean, it's like that, right? <laughs> but one of the other things that, that like almost all arachnids have to be able to do if they're male arachnids is be a good dancer. Like they've got to have some moves. And um, what do they, how do they dance? It depends. Yeah. Like scorpions, they um, do a, a promenade de deux. So they Whoa. like face the female and hold hands with her Whoa. and like dance back and forth, like like ballroom dancing. Like this. Yeah. Together. Like, like he holds her yeah. hands and like pulls her backwards and uh, pushes her forwards. Uh -huh. And like And that then they have sex? He, in the case of scorpions, actually what they do is he deposits this gelatinous oh. stalk called a spermatophore and it's like just kind of looks like a triangle of like jelly yeah and then at the top of it he puts a sperm packet what yeah a little packet oh my of sperm god and then he <laughs> then he pulls they're, they're still dancing while he does this he has to do it at the same the time same time dance. that's and multitasking and then he pulls her over the gelatinous stalk and if she thinks his courtship was good she'll like pick it like inseminate herself and if she didn't think it was good, like sometimes she'll eat it or she'll just like leave it there. This is so weird. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Because it's weird because it's so different to what we know. It's really weird. So, so dancing and then I deposit this gelatinous stock with sperm at the top. Yeah. And then I pull the female scorpion over it and then she gets to pick yeah. whether my courtship was good enough. Yeah. And she can inseminate herself or just eat it or leave it alone. Yeah. What a freaking crazy mating ritual. But it doesn't even end there because then the females <laughs> can actually decide whether they want to store the sperm or use it. Oh. So she can either then like use the sperm and actively inseminate her eggs or fertilize her eggs. Or she can just store it in this little chamber until she like decides it's a good time to. of the year to get pregnant. Whoa. Whoa. <clears throat> Which is interesting because then you, that they can wait a month, yeah. couple months potentially if it's the sperm still works. Probably years. They can wait. Whoa. Yeah. So they can almost like store the sperm and then go and try and court with other males to see like. They could use it, choose to use a different male sperm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they could they can kind of like rank the different courtships yeah. until they find the right. Like one. oh, this guy's a much better dancer. I wonder what their inventory is. Like, can they hold like six of them? Or I have no idea. Can they only hold one? Like, no how idea. large is their inventory? It yeah, feels we, like a game. We, we really don't know, it turns out, you know? <laughs> we, we've only like observed, scientifically observed courtships, like in a, you know, a few dozen species at the most. I want to observe courtship. So, if anyone uh, wants to get involved in um, observing biology, bio by being a biologist and observing courtships, I think that would be a fantastic uh, profession. There's Please. actually a whole lab at UC Berkeley that does just that. What is it called? Uh, the, it's called the Elias Lab. Okay. 
and they take high speed video and record the songs that spiders sing to their mates and the dances that they do. Spiders actually sing. Yeah, songs. they sing. Well, it's it's really like a an acoustic signal, so it's transmitted through the ground, and then they have ears in their feet that hear. Whoa. It's crazy. Whoa, yeah, let's get more labs like that, please. And they study jumping spiders, and jumping spiders do a coordinated song and dance, so they like make a sound that's independent from the dance they're, ma they're doing. And there's like the peacock, which is spider, which are, jumping spiders, which are yeah. jumping spiders, and it has this beautiful on its, what is this called, the bulb? Um, is this, is, this is called the body. The body. Yeah. At the body, it looks like a peacock. It was very yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Okay, let's transition. They're like, they're like the, the birds of paradise of the spider world. Birds of paradise yeah. of the spider world. Yeah, they're beautiful. And we'll, um, l let's, let's finish up by talking about science communication. Okay. So this is... That's we kind of meta, right? Yeah, we'll I know. Communicate which is what about we communication. Communi communicate about right. communication. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's have dialogue about it. Okay, because here we were talking about this at the beginning. We were explaining how if there were more role models that were teaching children that they could have the potential of working in a field in like field biology and and whatnot that that that's how we get more and more involvement in children in these fields. So what have been some of the principles, because we care so much about science communication and inspiring young people to build the future, what have been some of the cool things that you've learned over time about science communication that you'd want to share? I mean, I think part of, part of the reason that I work at a museum, and in particular the California Academy of Sciences, is because of the opportunities for science communication. Um, for me personally, I feel like as a scientist, especially a scientist in an era where science is questioned, we have a personal responsibility to communicate the science that we're doing, and not only the science we do, but the importance of science in general. So I, I never really received any kind of training in how to be a science communicator. I think I've just felt really passionately about it and practiced it a lot. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's right. like number one thing, like just practice. And passion. And, and, uh, and I have, I, I would say, I, I have a policy and every, my students know that this is my policy and I'm very vocal about it. And that's that I say yes to everything that I'm asked to do. Mm. Every opportunity for science communication that I'm asked, whether that's talking to a kindergarten class of mm. seven people or mm -hmm like speaking in front of 4,500 people, I say yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because I think that w we need to get the message out there in every venue that we possibly can about what we do and why we do it and why it's important to keep doing it and other people should consider it as a career. Yeah, you, the, I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that one of the principles of their Ex of their passion with science communication is to always say yes because no. that then opens up more and more I think it does. minds to yeah. the field. Yeah, that's that's cool. I like I that a lot. I think it does open up minds, and it also like for me personally, it opens up pos like potential and possibilities. It does, yeah. It's opened a lot of doors for me to say yes. Yeah. Um, and I encourage my students to say yes. Like obviously, I don't want them to say yes if it's adversely affecting them totally. and they're their like lives and their ability to get their work done as scientists because first and foremost that's what they have to do as students but i think that it's important to impress upon them that that we need to communicate what we're doing and and the more practice you get communicating what you're doing the better you get at telling people the story that's right and making yeah. them believe that it's important because i think as a scientist we all believe that what we're doing is important otherwise we probably wouldn't be doing it yeah and then what do you think about the sort of we, we have this, <clears throat> we have a little bit of a, there's like this gap between the really prominent sort of scientific researchers that are only in their own fields in the very deep nuance of their fields and then the general public. Yeah, there's a huge gap. So like, what do you think about? I mean, I think uh, we're trained to have that gap. Like part of the training of becoming a scientist, of getting a PhD is to become so specialized and such higher level thinking in in the field that you're studying that like you have a hard time figuring out how to like step backwards back down the ladder 
to tell the normal person what you're doing. And I think that there's a lot of ways that you can think through how to communicate, like your elevator pitch, right? Like how to communicate what you're doing to an, an ordinary person. Um, and I would say that more than ever, we need to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Um, because people like aren't believing in science anymore, which is horrible. Mm -hmm. But w a good place to start is just like in your own personal life. So even if you don't have time to go out and speak publicly or you don't have an inclination to go out and speak publicly because you have a fear of public speaking or you know whatever personal anxiety you have, you all you do have relationships with other human beings and most of like some of those people are not scientists and if you can get them to understand what you're doing and yeah. why it's important then you can explain it to anybody yeah i like how you you really you know it seems as though you're very you have a very strong you have a strong emotional tie to this and and i do yeah. too i think i think i think civilization as we embody science and as we embody um, figuring out how to collectively progress together, I think we'll be able to prosper better. And I, and I totally agree with the 30 second elevator pitch. We talk about that to entrepreneurs all the time. We're like, get your 30 second pitch down, get your 30 second yeah. pitch down, ask powerful questions, ask powerful questions. And so when you can, when you can really get someone inspired about, um, about biology or evolution, um, R really quickly, I think that can be a big light for people that, you know, you can just, like you were saying at the beginning, you're flipping over some bricks and you're looking at what's underneath of them, some stones and just seeing what creatures live under there. All right, last, uh, last couple of questions that we like to ask on the show. Do you think we're in a simulation? I don't know. I think about it and it like kind of freaks me out so I have to stop myself. But like, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna like hope that we're not because if it is like I feel like something's going wrong with the simulation right now and it's like spiraling out of control. It's a challenge. But um, this, is this experiment to see if humans can persevere through the challenge. I mean in some ways like evolution is a simulation right? It like, is yeah it's all a bunch of variables and yeah. being computed right now. Yeah I'm thinking like inevitably humans are going to go extinct. Like that's inevitable in the evolutionary scale of time. We can digitize our consciousness. We could, but then who will care? <laughs> who will care? Who cares now? Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, how about are we alone in the cosmos? I, I don't think we are. Yeah, okay. What I feel do you like, think like the, the probability of that is so low that there has to be other, other beings, whether they're conscious beings or not, it's not for me to determine, but like the probability of other, of other life. I'll even go as far as to say other carbon-based life being in the cosmos is high. Yeah, and then what do you think that looks like? I don't know, I hope it looks like a bunch of like giant chihuahuas, because they're yeah. cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a, you had a, I had a chihuahua. chihuahua yeah. I had a chihuahua for 17 years. Yeah. It was adorable. This is your bias towards wanting <laughs> civilizations of chihuahuas. <laughs> Like imagine just like a herd of chihuahuas yeah. running around and then they like stop and start talking to you. Tell, yeah, exactly. Like a thousand of them at the same time. Like just like, like think of the like Taco Bell chihuahua. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh, I don't know. I think that the most beautiful thing in the world is like real nature. And that's really hard to find. Uh, like un unhuman mediated nature basically doesn't exist anymore. I mean, humans have been around for a very, very long time changing our ecosystems, like way before like the agricultural revolution or the tech revolution or anything else. Totally. Um, and so we've been changing those landscapes forever and there's very few landscapes that we haven't touched. Uh, and when you see those, it's like really a thing of beauty, nature and the history of evolution of life on earth has created some magical stuff. That was such a good answer, and I don't think we've had that y exact answer yet. We've had like the most beautiful thing is that it's it's Earth without the humans or something like that. But that's like the closest we've gotten, and I think <clears throat> we've talked on the show a lot about what were the feelings that were felt in humans that first made it to land that was unexplored, and that that is such a profound 
feeling. And you talk about the beauty of that land, and I think that's what really gets us wanting to birth out of the womb of Earth is to be able to go and look at what those other unexplored yeah. territories look like yeah. and also make these virtual worlds where we can then m synthesize what it would be like to go and find new land. Um, it's just, yeah, it's exhilarating and it's gorgeous and you can have a thousand Chihuahua civilizations with waterfalls yeah. and star systems. And Maybe whatever. that's what the Aztecs were after. <laughs> Um, that was such a that was such a good answer, um, Lauren. This has been such a pleasure. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. This is look at all of this cool stuff that we learned about mm -hmm. today, and thank you for coming onto the show. Thank you for having me. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Go and build the future. Go and manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Much love and join us join us in the movement hit that subscribe button below also join us if you want to see us scale our content impact more people we have plenty of positions that we want to hire for chop these clips up from 60 minutes down into one minute segments and circulate those join us patreons below cryptocurrencies below join us across those platforms twitter instagram you can find us everywhere much love and we'll see you soon peace